So at uh, 7.01 p.m., uh, we declare the Board of Directors meeting for Thursday, November 17th, 2022 for MCE, duly convened. Uh, would you call the roll, please? Belvedere. Benicia. Concord. Concord. One hour short. Chimes. Oh. <laughs> Contra Costa County. Here. Concord. Contra Costa County. Corte Madera. Danville. Here. El Cerrito. Here from Kansas City. Welcome. Fairfax. Here. Fairfield. Here. Lafayette. Here. Larkspur. Uh, Larkspur is here. And Lafayette is here? Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Tony Marin. Martinez. Here. Mill Valley. Here. Moraga. Here. Napa. Napa. Brad, uh, there you go. Uh, there, I don't think he can. We can't hear you, but it looks like you're unmuted. Yeah. Okay, we'll come back. Novato? Oakley? Here. Pinal? Here. Pittsburgh? Here. Pleasant Hill? Here. Richmond? Here. Uh, yeah, Ross. Here. San Anselmo. Here. San Pablo. Here. San Rafael. San Ramon. Here. Salcedo. Here. Solano. Tiburon. Here. Vallejo. Walnut Creek. Here. Quorum established. Okay, thank you. Um, so just so you know, uh, Dawn claims to be at a work conference. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know whether that's accurate or not, but we'll take her word for it. So she won't, she will not be here. And the CEO responsibilities will be shared by Vicken and Jamie as we go through items tonight. Um, are there any more, uh, any other board announcements from board members? Okay, I don't see any. So uh, we'll move into the next item, which is public open time. This is an opportunity for the public to uh, speak on items that are not on our agenda or are or, or, or on the closed session agenda. Uh, do we have any speakers? I see no raised hands, Chair. Okay, we will move on. Uh, next item is uh, resolution number 2022-13. Authorizing uh, continued remote teleconference meetings for the board of directors and every committee of the board of directors pursuant to government code 5495E. Uh, is there any uh, public, any discussion on that? Uh, Director Wagon Connect, did you, you got a hand up? Uh, you're muted. Um, okay, is, are there any uh, public speakers on that item? I see no raised hands, Chair. Okay, do we have a motion? So moved. Quinto. Hey, he was second. Okay, motion by Quinto. Uh, who was the second? I might have been. Eddie Bersan. Okay. Okay, we'll give it to uh, Bersan. 
Okay, uh, would you call the roll, please? Belvedere? Benicia? Concord? Yes. Contra Costa County? Corte Madera? Danville? Yes. El Cerrito? Yes. Fairfax? Yes. Fairfield? Yes. Lafayette? Yes. Larkspur? Yes. County of Marin? Martinez? Yes. Mill no Valley? Yes. Moraga? Yes. Napa? We got you. Oh. Nevada. Oakley. Yes. Pinal. Yes. Pittsburgh. Finalized. Yes. Pleasant Hill. Yes. Richmond. Yes. Ross. Yes. San Anselmo. Yes. San Pablo. Yes. San Rafael. San Ramon. Yes. Salcedo. Yes. Solano. Tiburon. Yes. Vallejo. Yes. Walnut Creek. Yes. Motion carries. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. The, the next item is report from the chief executive officer, and this will either be a Vicken uh, and or Jamie. So, yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Director. But so Vicken Kasarjan, uh, I'll be giving the CEO report this evening because Don is away at an energy conference. But Director Bud said with legislature and may not have the good connectivity during this meeting. So first, I wanted to share the exciting news that uh, MCE has received climate bond certification for the prepayment transaction we completed in uh, 2021. That means our transaction is officially designated as a green bond and is climate certified. This is the official designation that renders the bonds eligible for ongoing investment by green investment funds and other investor groups and categories that only make investments in companies and entities that are fighting climate change. Second, I wanted to let you know that the cost of living adjustment for the new year has been released and it came in at 6%. MCE calculated the COLA using the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics CPI index for the San Francisco Bay Area and is either uh, the October 12 month, 12 month CPI percentage change with the 6% mm -hmm. or the average of January, April, July, and October, which came at 5.74%, whichever is higher. Third, I wanted to remind you to save the date for a virtual holiday party set for the evening of December 9th, starting at 6.30. Uh, fourth, I would like to introduce you to J.B. Ackman, MCE's new Director of Public Affairs. She joined us in October and comes to us with deep experience in the public sector in more than 20 years in communications. Uh, before joining MCE, J.B. led communications, marketing, research, government relations, and community outreach teams for San Jose Water, Santa Cruz Metro, Caltrain, the San Mateo County Transit District, and Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority. JB also serves in an elected role as Vice President of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District Board of Directors, and as a member of the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency Board of Directors in North Santa Cruz County. Uh, we're very happy to have her join us, and I know she looks forward to engaging with your board and communities as well. Uh, lastly, we do plan to hold our regular board meeting on December 15th, so please keep that date on your calendar. Thank you very much. Um, any board members have any questions or comments for uh, Vicken? 
Uh, do we have any public speakers on this item? I see no raised hands, Chair. Okay. Uh, that brings us to the consent calendar. We have um, three items on the consent calendar. Does anyone wish to pull anyone up, any, any of them off? Okay, I think we're ready for a motion on the consent calendar. I move the consent calendar. Okay, I'll, I'll motion second. By, motion by Green, second by Perkins. Uh, call the roll, please. Wow. Alvadir. How are you doing? Benicia. Concord. Concord. Contra Costa County. Corte Madera. Danville. Yes. Al Cerrito. Yes. Fairfax. Yes. Fairfield. Yes. Lafayette. Yes. Larkspur. Yes. County of Marin. Martinez. Yes. Mill Valley. Mill Valley. Moraga. Yes. Napa. Yes. Thank you. Did you hear me? Yes. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Nevado. Oakley. Yes. Pinal. Yes. Pittsburgh. Pleasant Hill. Yes. Richmond. Yes. Ross? Yes. San Anselmo? Yes. San Pablo? Um, yes. San Rafael? Uh, but that, that questionnaire is the same one that San Ramon? Yes. Salcedo? Yes. Solano? Kibron? Yes. Vallejo? Yes. Walnut Creek? Yes. Uh, Concord, yes. I had problems. Thank you. Motion carries. <laughs> uh, Mill Valley, yes, as well. Thank you. Pittsburgh, yes, as well. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, because of, for, uh, because of scheduling constraints, um, I'm going to move item 10 up uh, and take that up next. So item 10 is electrification reach code adoption model, uh, external presentation by Brian Reyes, sustainability planner uh, with the County of Marin. So um, go ahead when you're ready. Hey, director, but as, as Brian is getting set up here, I wanted to introduce the topic a bit. Uh, Board members, my name is Sebastian Kahn. I'm a community development manager as part of our public affairs team here at MCE. And as many of you know, every three years, the state of California updates its building standards codes. And when this happens, local jurisdictions can choose to adopt the state standards or implement what we call reach codes. And those are building codes that reach above and beyond state standards and encourage or require all electric or all electric readiness for new buildings. And as some of you may have seen this week, the most recent MCE member community to adopt such a code was the County of Marin. And prior to that ordinance adoption and in partnership with MCE, the County of Marin staff conducted robust community outreach to local municipal staff, to building officials and community advocates to develop a proposed code that was inclusive and reflective of community feedback. And so with that, uh, we're joined today by Brian Reyes, who's a sustainability planner with the County of Marin's uh, community, community Development Agency and Sustainability Team. There's no action required of the board on this agenda item. This is simply an educational opportunity for you all to learn more and ask any questions about an emerging trend in the industry. And so with that, I will turn it over to Brian. Thanks for, thanks for the intro, Sebastian. 
good, good evening, MCA board. Thank you for your time. So um, as Sebastian mentioned, I'll be presenting on um, the counties and our collective jurisdictions um, uh, model, or we like to say prototype green building and reach codes that we developed in concert with not only building staff, but also community members across uh, Marin. So these codes will ideally go into effect uh, January 1, 2023, um, in compliance with state standards. Uh, I believe someone's controlling it, so next slide, please. So I always like to start with this, uh, just sort of set the tone. I mean, we kind of agree, not kind of, I think we can all agree that the cost of failing to act on climate change is tremendous. Um, it's one of more more pressing problems across our community and it intersects so many other challenges that we all face, housing, affordability, fires, uh, droughts in the economy. Um, next slide, please. Whether it's the state, the country, the states, our counties or our local jurisdictions, we've all kind of set uh, carbon neutrality targets um, not all, but most of us. And here in particular in California and in particular in Marin County, we put set zero by 2045. Uh, and that is adopted by our respective councils across the 12 Marin jurisdictions. So we've all made these commitments to tackle climate action, emission reduction goals, whether by 2045, and then having the interim targets about 40 to 60 percent, depending on what jurisdictions you, you talk to in 2030. Next slide, please. And so we kind of see a lot of these, uh, you see the emission reductions and we all create these plans, maybe many of you are familiar with, and it kind of lays out what are the local actions and measures that we can take? What are the state measures we can take? State, I'm sure you all are pretty familiar with renewable portfolio standards, and there's also uh, transportation, low carbon fuel standards, and state grid building standards. Um, locally, um, and I'm just going to highlight the first three bullet, uh, bullet points, the main um, tools in the toolbox we have locally are addressing energy efficiency and electrification, uh, focusing on low carbon transport and renewable energy. Next slide, please. So green building reach codes, um, I like to say, is one of the only tools in that toolbox that lo local jurisdictions have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That is the kind of the one place where you can truly enforce something um, should the community move forward and agree with that. Next slide, please. And so re building codes could be very complicated. Maybe some of you are familiar with, but um, if I just a brief, brief primer, the state sets um, uh, building standard codes every three years via this uh, Title 24. And they establish new construction requirements for everything from plumbing to fire safety. Um, two parts of Title 24 are Part 6 and 11. And Part 6 details measures to touch upon briefly today applies to energy savings and green building standards. Um, uh, part 6 uh, is about energy codes. And Part 11 is about mandatory and voluntary measures on how to comply with California's green building standard codes. So while these baseline standards apply across state, county, and city governments are allowed to adopt standards that are more stringent, as Sebastian mentioned in the beginning, that go above and beyond, and those are referred to as REACH codes. So today, um, we, as in the county of Marin, I, I represent unincorporated, um, are in a 2019 code cycle, um, and we adopted REACH codes uh, since then, and so the requirements in that flow down from the state to the county and to the city governments. Um, so our local entity can go below the code or we're allowed to adopt standards that are more astringent. Uh, next slide, please. So this is nothing new in Marin and across other jurisdictions in California. Um, and Marin particularly has a legacy of decarbon decarbonizing our, our grid. Um, uh, decarbonizing our buildings as well. Um, and, and from 2001 to 2008, um, we looked across new constructions, renovations, and appliance change outs. And so we had first, for those first 17 years, um, energy efficiency requirements just focus on new construction and nothing on renovations or appliance change outs. Uh, next, please. And so um, more recently in 2019, 2022, we 
uh, upped our uh, energy efficiency requirements for new constructions. And in renovations, we still don't require anything, but we have incentives that are voluntary. And um, uh, in Marin County, we have a, a Electrify Marin, which are incentives and rebates. Uh, for those who want to voluntarily uh, uh, also switch out uh, their appliances to uh, all electric or more energy efficiency um, uh, appliances. Next slide or next, please. Um, so from uh, more recently, what we actually adopted recently at the county and what we developed as model or prototype reach codes for other jurisdictions to, Marin to consider they are all electric uh, requirements for new construction. So all new buildings will not have gas uh, linked up to it um, moving forward from 2023. Um, and in renovations, this is sort of new for single family residents. This reflects a lot of our, or represents a majority of our building stock across our community. Um, we have stronger energy efficiency and or electrification measures requirements. Um, and then the appliance change outs, we don't have any requirements. It's still continuing the incentives, but we're still trying to assess the equity and cost impacts of uh, presenting such a, a code requirement. Uh, next, please. So question mark is what do we have moving forward? Um, you can kind of see this decarbonization legacy and phasing over the last two decades. And it looks like in order to get to those last bits, we have to find ways to get our at uh, the appliance change out. So replacing a lot of our gas combustion equipment. So it's not only us, but we're trying to be prudent because the air district and maybe the state will start regulating air emissions or uh, stationary emissions in homes and commercial buildings that will effectively not allow the sale of uh, gas equipment within the building stock. So to be determined. Um, next slide, please. So here's what we came up with um, for our proposed prototype or model reach codes. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with this and some of in your communities is all electric for new construction. We recommended across all building types. Uh, this is on par with market and policy trends um, as this is gonna be inevitable. Um, there are no additional energy efficiency requirements beyond state standards for those that go all electric. Um, and then the third highlight is all buildings newly constructed be recommended, not previously occupied. And there'd be a, a variety of exemptions or exemption, exceptions. And the more common one is to exempt uh, restaurants and food establishments, um, backup generation for critical facilities, et cetera, um, among many others. Next slide, please. The, the second sort of tranche to our, uh, our recommended reach codes or billing codes is um, addressing the single family existing uh, buildings. In our model reach code, we said single family projects over 70, 50 square feet um, will be required to meet this reach code. Um, 750 square feet is what we figured for unincorporated county. Every jurisdiction may decide something lower or higher. Um, the key point to the renovations reach codes is that there's energy efficiency or electrification, heat pumps or induction requirements using what the state developed a flexible compliance pathway. So this is basically choosing from a menu of energy efficiency or measures and adding up to an energy score savings, sort of like a calorie diet. It's like, I got to meet 2000 calories, add up all your measures that you put in that you choose from that menu. And then there's your, uh, your compliance. Um, one thing we did mandate in order to prepare um, uh, our building stock um, and we recommend is to do electric readiness and lighting requirements for all projects because those, those are pretty nominal in cost and it also prepares us for the inevitable transition um, to all electric buildings. Next slide, please. Okay, the last part is um, EV infrastructure, EV readiness codes. And so we've had this at least in a handful of our marine jurisdictions, and I believe some of yours um, for a while. But the main thing here is that in single family residences that are new, newly constructed or when their panel is upgraded, they have to be EV ready. And that basically means having a receptacle ready for them to charge sort of a, a receptacle that's uh, akin to your um, where, where your where your laundry machine would plug into for multifamily. Um, 
it says pending there, but um, it's confirmed that we recommended that um, jurisdictions deviate from state standards so we can get 100% uh, access charging capabilities to all uh, units with parking spaces. And so it's a combination of um, um, some EV charging stations a little bit, and then there's some um, just uh, uh, plugins that you could plug into receptacle. Uh, people could just power up that way. Um, for existing multifamily and non-residential, that's commercial. Um, we also, when someone's modifying their parking lot, we recommend that um, there's EV ready risk requirements and EV charging stations that go above state standards. Um, there's other parts to uh, the Cal Green, um, sorry, the EV code, um, but those were the main uh, tenants. Next slide, please. I think one thing that you all be interested in is our stakeholder engagement. So over the last year and a half, um, and Sebastian was part of this in MCE, was stakeholder engagements in our community. And so the idea here is we didn't develop everything in a vacuum. It was based on research and market policy and trends and research and white papers, but also what our community felt like could happen and what they wanted. So it wasn't only um, city staff or your typicals. We try to get a lot of people uh, deep community engagement. So the rundown is we had about five monthly technical working meetings with each city and town building officials and planners, one public community workshop, three focus groups that included the building community, environmental advocates, equity priority communities, community-based organizations, seniors aging in place, anyone that may be affected by these type of codes were engaged and allowed uh, an opportunity to really influence. And I mean, people really did contribute to things that I didn't even realize were an opportunity or were a hurdle. So one thing from those workshops or one of many things is a lot of people gained empathy, whether it was an advocate talking to a developer and vice versa. So that was, that was good to see. And, um, we had ad hoc presentations and conversations with the community commissions elected, and then our county reach codes and model reach codes were developed and shared with other jurisdictions over the last couple months um, in an ongoing effort to what we call try to unify our building codes where possible. Um, the intent of the reach codes were being collaborative for, men, uh, for Marin, certainly, but it's not just for Marin. Um, so this model code can be scaled and used across other California jurisdictions, especially those across MCE's territory. So it's the code language, the implementation enforcement tools uh, that help with staff capacity, uh, stakeholder engagement strategy, and the, what we did, I've recorded all that could serve as a template. Uh, so um, all a jurisdiction would have to do would be to adapt the material should the community electives decide to pass green building codes above and beyond state standards. I am talking with some of my counterparts across your territories and seeing what, if they would like to borrow some of my material or if I can also learn from them as well. Um, so next slide and I'll wrap up. Um, so policy and requirements is one end, that's the stick as it were, but there's also the carrots, there's the incentives and those are equally important. So um, programs are available to help homeowners um, businesses and developers. Uh, we have electrify Marin here locally. There's a Bay, Bay Area Regional Energy Network, which does a lot of staff capacity building and connecting um, uh, users or, or customers with contractors and staff training. Um, we have a Marin County Business Green, Green Business Program and then MCE EV rebate program, which you probably all are familiar with, is key to helping us meet our EV requirements. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so our next step is working with cities and towns across Marin. We're currently in that, and I'm helping each jurisdiction, should they want to, support their adoption of the recommended standards, whole, in part, or none at all. But I'm still here for them if they need to help with implementation and staff capacity into the new year. Next bullet point. Um, trainings for building department staff, architects, and builders has been ongoing for a while, and that will continue with not only myself, but with our networks and some of my colleagues within the County Marin. Next, please. And um, 
the ease of implementation and access to financing is super important. So mm -hmm. to develop an enforcement guide to support staff and jurisdictions, and as well as those in the applicants that are over, over the counter is important, um, including information about available financing and technical support so that people can trip over these things. A lot of people just don't know this is uh, this stuff is available and that it can be fundable um, and incentives or rebates are available. Next, and I'll wrap up. Uh, thank you. And um, yeah, if you are interested in learning more, you go to that uh, website down below. Um, it gives, it's transparent, it gives you all the information and, and collateral that, um, and research and FAQs that we've developed over the last year and a half. So everyone, thank you for your time. And if there's any questions, um, I can take them now. Uh, thank you, Brian. Does anybody have questions for Brian? Uh, I don't see any hands. If I if you have a question and I can't see your hand, go ahead and speak up. Uh, Brian, Rick, I see one director I know to go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you. So my question is, with all of the housing elements that we're all working on, what we're trying, what the developers are saying is to reduce um, parking spots. And so with those reduced parking spots, I imagine it will also reduce the possibility of having a charge, you know, for the cars that are there. So have you encountered that? And what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you, Teresa. So yes, um, the way we wrote the code, as well as um, other jurisdictions in the South and East Bay with multifamily particularly, is not linking it to units, is that any unit with a parking space. So it's really about how many parking spaces are developed because my thoughts about that is oh, EVs is one part of the solution. I mean, a part of it is also giving people alternative modes of transit and linking communities like that. In absence of that, um, it was, you know, EVs will be there for every parking spot. Um, it is outside the scope of this, of, of sort of the model reach code to figure out who, how many parking happens or not. Um, but it is, we've heard that across our engagement. And um, right now it's just, all we could do is say, look, this is linked to the parking spaces and we don't want to interfere with all those local or, um, or those regional requirements about parking or not. Uh, uh, Director Kelman, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, but um, thanks very much for this, uh, Brian. We've been looking at this closely in Sausalito. I talked about the grand jury report as well. I have two questions. Um, the first uh, is about equity. Um, and so what, can you maybe share with us some of the thinking around uh, having a model reach code for new construction versus remodel and what type of equity considerations the county took into account in terms of the cost? And then the second question is really about um, grid capabilities and uh, disaster preparedness should the grid go down and we've pushed towards electrification. What's the disaster preparedness plan behind some of the model reach codes? Sure. Uh, so the, four, uh, the first part of that is for equity considerations, two things that stick out of mind um, that were meaningful um, in our community was um, about renters really. Um, so when we developed these reach codes, we knew that um, we needed to get the community organizations and those communities in there that understood renters. So we engaged with Canal Alliance, some other uh, organizations as San Rafael, uh, the west side of Marin County, because they're disconnected from the grid, as it were. And um, one thing they didn't, we wanted, they wanted to make sure is that, um, and that other jurisdictions across California put in was exempting um, those who qualified for, uh, who have low income qualifications. Um, so we made sure that was in there. So one of the exemptions, particularly for renovations is for low income um, people and they have to, we're streamlining the way we, uh, they can apply for that. Um, the other part of that was um, for multifamily is if we're, it's kind of hard to make an equity can sort of argument here, but it's sort of like if, if we're talking about an EV transition as being one of a, one of the 
tools that everyone in a parking space should have the ability to charge, right? If we want to transition sort of the massive fleet where the majority of our emissions lie in the transportation sector, um, we're going to have to give access, somehow find access to people who, when the eventual transition of the cars get in. So we thought that towards an equity lens as well. Um, a lot of our engagements were seniors and aging in place. And one thing they talked about was medical equipment and emergency. So in our hardship and feasibility um, exemptions, that is captured in there um, as well. And those are some of the recommendations we made um, to our model reach code, but also for unincorporated county that we took into account. One thing that our West side of Marin, who's not connected to the gas grid, um, said is like, hey, we need to have incentives and rebates, right? Like, because we are spending a lot on propane um, to heat or power, whatever it is. So we need access to incentive rebates to get the electric heat pumps, solar PV, and all those things. So whether it's MCE is helping out on the west side or uh, and our code requirements is making it easy for them to, uh, to permit uh, uh, heat pumps or providing incentives of rebates and connecting them that way. Um, they wanted that to happen more. And so um, those are some pieces there that we- Right, on the re rebates, they have to be quite attractive to substantially offset the conversion of subject appliances to electricity because the post-conversion and electrical operating costs would also require significant subsidies as electrification of appliances that currently run on natural gas are going to be substantially higher based on the average the average natural gas prices over the next 10 years. So did you guys run that cost benefit analysis or you know plot that out into how aggressive we could get on the rebates? Correct. So the state did a, a study and it was uh, published in Redwood Energy. So in fact, if you're if we're comparing what would cost more, we have to also look at the deferred cost from gas infrastructure. You put in gas infrastructure, you're going to plummet, you're going to pipe it, you have to put up a new meter. So let's go all electric. Let's play the cost benefit analysis of, let's take that away, right? So that's a cost you defer, but electric will go uh, will go in now, but you don't have to pay the meter for gas. In addition, you have to look at the life cycle costs. And I know that doesn't fly with a lot of people because we look at what's on bill, right? And we totally get that. Um, so uh, Redwood Energy said that about if in a multifamily development, if done right, an all electric can save about 3,300 per unit in development costs. So if done right, if done right. And I can provide you a study. It's, it's actually on our FAQs and our resources on the Green Building Reach Codes page. Oh, great. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to comment on disaster preparedness? Oh, disaster preparedness. Um, yeah, and so in terms of resiliency, um, you know, it, it's kind of like the grid, right? We have to look, and Sebastian can probably answer this better than I can, but right now, in terms of reliability, we'll just look at reliability, not just resiliency. Uh, reliability is that um, the grid is, the way I like to say in a nutshell is the grid is transitioning with us. It's not as if everything's going to go on all at once, right? And so if we're just looking at Marin County, it's new construction for now, right? And so those will be have to be planned with PG&E to get on board and then they'll be phased in. Um, you know, it's so the way I like to think about it is it's not all coming in at once, number one. Number two is I know that, is it 115%? I think 115% of capacity has to be planned above and beyond to handle any uh, uh, peak uh, events. Um, so, uh, Sebastian, you all had created a, um, uh, a fact sheet on that. Um, so if you want to speak more to that, I'd be happy to have you chime in. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. I, I think you summed up things well. Director Kelman, we, we do have a, a one pager that we put together on some of this information. So if that's helpful for you, I'm happy to share that. Um, and with other members of the board as well. Um, okay. Are you good, Director Kilman? I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, D Director Perry, go ahead. 
Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, really good presentation and very happy to see this past the county. Um, just hoping you could talk a little bit about the rollout uh, in other uh, city jurisdictions and kind of what the timeline is for that and uh, some of the resources you can offer. Thanks. Sure, yeah. Um, it's a variety, at least some, all I'm really familiar with is the 12 jurisdictions, including unincorporated across Marin. So, um, um, so San Rafael and um, has uh, adopted or is about to adopt something. Uh, we adopted unincorporated um, Fairfax and Corte Madera as well um, is about to adopt something. So um, those or and, and and Fairfax already went all electric as well as San Anselmo. Um, so they're all going to go into effect January 2023. Um, some of them decided to adopt our, our recommendations. Uh, well, actually, most of them, except for Fairfax is the only one who adopted all three in, in line with the unincorporated. The others did it, uh, all three in terms of the new construction, the single family renovations and the EV code. Um, some other, most other jurisdictions did it in part, like just wanted to focus on the new construction and the EV codes and not touch the, the existing building to see how it pounds out with us. Um, and then, so that's going into effect during 2023. Some have uh, decided because of staff capacity um, issues, um, decided to do uh, the codes in Q1. Um, but we recommend doing it ASAP because it's super important to align with the state codes. Um, as soon as there's some misalignment, it, it's just best practice. As soon as there's some misalignment, you're going to get several different codes all happening within a very tight time window. And so that confuses the building community. So our biggest recommendation is to, um, uh, is if you're gonna do something, do it in a line with the, the state codes. And I will, um, uh, all that green, that URL green building reach codes provides all the collateral and information that any jurisdiction needs to adopt. In addition, they can contact me as some jurisdictions have in which I'm happy to support and provide materials as well. Thank you. Uh, Director Quinto, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, Brian, I, I appreciate this uh, great presentation. In El Cerrito, we're about to complete and uh, the council is about to approve uh, our uh, updated climate action plan. And we've have, we have had activists speak at my council meeting the other day saying that they want this stuff now. Uh, but uh, in the real world, we're not gonna get it now. And it's gonna take, you know, let's, let's just be honest. Uh, the federal government just approved uh, you know, the, the earmarks that uh, Mayor Pro Tem Murphy, uh, MCE staff and I, uh, when we reached out to our uh, congressional delegation representing MCE, uh, that we do have earmarks for this. But uh, this is going to challenge cities first. Yeah. And middle class, upper middle class, small towns, which is the majority of uh, our area, we have to pay for this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and, and this is why you see more uh, uh, EV infrastructure in challenged cities, and you don't see any in Berkeley and El Cerrito. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we, you know, and I, and looking at what the federal government is doing, uh, making sure they keep that atomic plant open in San Luis Obispo. Uh, we're gonna have brownouts in the future uh, if we uh, do this. So it needs to be done in incremental uh, uh, ways and, and I support that. Uh, but listening to the 350.org folks, uh, it is unreasonable what uh, they are asking. And in the real world, it's going to take until 2040 to get some of the stuff in. So uh, yeah. know that, um, you know, I appreciate the cities that have refineries. They need this stuff first. And, uh, and but the small towns that we represent, it's going to take a long time. So my city, we are going to do electrification just for our new transit oriented developments. And I support that. Uh, but, um, you know, looking at EV infrastructure, uh, that is complicated. The EV infrastructure that we're working on with MCE, you know, I, I appreciate the, the help and assistance work that we're getting, but it's super expensive. And, uh, uh, and uh, the, the folks that uh, 
uh, were handing me, I'm getting this done, getting this done. Um, you know, it's not going to be done overnight. It's going to take at least 15 years. So uh, just wanted to point that out to everyone. Uh, this is uh, um, something that is going to go back and forth for many, many years. It's not going to happen overnight. But I appreciate our, our congressional delegation who support what MCE is doing. Uh, and, and these are folks in Marin, Contra Costa, uh, Solano County, and Devin Murphy and I spoke to uh, our representatives there and in Napa County. And uh, they're all in support of that. So uh, appreciate this great presentation. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen in incremental measures. So thanks again, Brian. Yeah, thanks, Gabe. If I may just respond, I, I yeah, as, as I said, it's like this is this is a transition, right? And there's certainly a tension because like, you know, 2030, 2040, that's not too far away, right? It's like yeah. how fast do we move? Who moves? Who does what first? Um, access to funding, whereas IRA, that's going to have to shake out how we're going to distribute that down from the, the state level down to the local level. And I know that's going to end up being us at the county level or some of the organizations within your particular regions that are going to make that help that money flow down to us as the customers. Um, there are different rules. I'm not sure if you uh, heard about PGM Rule 29 about EV infrastructure. Um, I, if, if I could just respectfully just push back a little bit on it's going to be super expensive and uh, there's yeah it, it'll be expensive right this is something we're asking our communities to go above and beyond yeah, we need to be but honest about moving that. yeah 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 and then I, I i think that it could be done as long as you know you said your dele all our delegations are saying hey this is costly for us if we continue beating that drum hopefully more money will flow down uh, yeah. But for right now, as far as our research is, is, is seen, is like there's a lot happening right now to bring these costs down tremendously, particularly for the developers. Um, right. When we're talking PGE Rule 29, that's basically they're going to pay for all the utility side of the cost, uh, including the transformer um, and, and uh, energizing. Uh, part of that. So so basically all the costs that I've heard the developers say is like, well, man, when I amp up those transformers, uh, but yeah. that calculation was done in mind with they're going to end up paying for it. But now it's sort of the rate payers <laughs> collectively pay for it. Yeah. So yeah. it keep beating the drum, I, 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 I would say, yeah. So we can get to that transition faster. This is, it, it's sort of inevitable. And in, in the research is just like, I don't know how else we're going to, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So our obsolete uh, charger at City Hall parking lot, we're working with, uh, we are working with MCE, but it is thousands and thousands. It's, yeah. it's not like a couple of thousands. It's, yeah. it's maybe like uh, 56 or 60,000 for just one charger. So, uh, you know, in yeah. small towns, uh, yeah. that's, that's difficult when we're going through a recession and yeah. uh, folks need to pay their unfunded liabilities. So just wanted to give sure. you my perspective on this. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks, Kate. Uh, Director Kohler, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to give an update. So I'm from Fairfax, Brian, and you've been working with Sean and Mark Lockaby. Um, we did adopt the codes as suggested by the county, but we actually went more aggressive in specifically on renovations, we looked at where most of our renovations start and they're at 200 feet. So we went more uh, restrictive than the county did. And as you mentioned, we went all electric for new construction a few months ago. That's apart from the building codes. But I will say in response to Director Quinto, um, you know, some of our advocates want us to require people to change out every piece of gas infrastructure and we just can't burden folks with that at this point. We are looking at the possibility in the future of when, for example, your uh, heater dies to switch out to electric, but we're not there yet. But I can tell you, we're getting a lot of pushback saying we got to do this now and we have to kind of weigh everything. But we went probably more aggressive than some and we're also going, there are parts of this that you don't have to do in the building code that we'll be looking at our health and safety code over the next six months to see if we can go a little even tighter. But I hear you, I'm kind of the voice on the council saying, wait a minute, we've got to weigh what this is costing people as well. 
So thank you for the presentation. I've seen a lot of it and it's really helpful. Great. And regarding the appliance change out that Barbara had mentioned, that is, you know, when something burns out and you need to replace, there's, we also, we didn't have that as a starting point with our proto, uh, model reach code uh, because we felt, as you said, the equity and cost issues, um, contractors um, base is still, they're there for sort of the big renovations, but doing the quick appliance change out is challenging. So there's just too many hurdles. Uh, County Marin and um, I'm, maybe we could share that when it comes out is at the end of the year, we're having someone research on what that would look like. Cause that's in our climate action plan to endeavor, but someone um, had done, we, we got some research from Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara about, um, you know, what are the impacts um, of doing appliance change out through an equity lens. Um, so that will come out at the end of the year. Uh, Director Thier, go ahead. <clears throat> yes, I just wanted to thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I was also looking at whether we can provide, you know, a lot of the questions that we get are regarding incentives uh, for switching, for current homeowners to switch from um, gas to electric um, when they're replacing appliances. Is there a way that we could get a list of all of those together for our residents? And um, if so, um, there has been some issues reported to us about them running out. Um, yeah. so, so that's something that yeah. I was hoping we can try to address. I think people really do wanna switch, uh, but sometimes uh, you know, they'd like an incentive and also some education as to how uh, to accomplish uh, the task of switching out. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, I can probably share, I'm just gonna make a note here. Um, some of you are familiar with the Bay Regional Energy Network, or sorry, sorry Holly, where are you located, your, your, your community? Are you in, in the nine county area? Yes, uh, Tiburon. Tiburon, okay, sorry. Apologies in Tiburon in our area. Um, so in our area, and I'll, I'll certainly send it to this group, um, whoever it is, um, Bayron has a contractor's list. And in that contractor's list, it's people who are qualified to also, uh, they have the robust list of, of, of incentives and rebates. In Marin County particularly, it's Electrify Marin. Um, and so we have that also uh, program um, in terms of incentives and rebates. Education is always hard, I will say, for government, as many of you know, um, and outreach, uh, limited funds, little capacity to do an amazing job of communicating to everyone across social media platforms and websites and wherever people get information. We're not, it, it's really hard for us to do that. So we, our opportunities are in stakeholder engagements like this, as well as over-the-counter interactions um, and so one thing that's, I think there's a group in the East Bay, uh, my crown parts in the East Bay, they're creating sort of a hub. And that's something that we are thinking about here where uh, we wanna make sure it's building staff capacity specifically ab about um, our codes here locally in Marin, but also all the incentives and rebates need to trip over. It's amazing how many developers said, oh wait, there's that technology. I didn't know that that could bring our down our, our net operating income. Oh, there's even PGE Rule 29. We didn't even know that existed. We so it's just kind of like, you know, information getting out there is difficult, and it's something that um, you know we're trying to solve for. Um, but um, Holly I, and everyone, I can share all this information with you. Um, Thank you so much. This is Jamie Tucky. Hi, everyone. I, I would just um, like to add, Director Thier, that MCE does have um, a variety of resources with information about the rebates and incentives that are available for our customers, both from MCE um, and other partner organizations. And we're also um, working on preparing additional mm -hmm. educational materials that we will be sharing with you in the um, the coming weeks um, that provide comprehensive information about all of MCE's rebates and programs that um, span across all of the different programs that we offer. So um, thank you for flagging that and we'll be happy to share that information with you. 
Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Yes, I forgot to say MC, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions or comments from uh, board members? Uh, do we have any public speakers on this item? I see no raised uh, hands, sir. Okay. Well, thank you. That was very interesting. So now we'll move to our original number seven item, uh, proposed MCE rate adjustment effective January 1st, 2023. Yes, and uh, we have uh, Gar Salisbury, Justin Kudo, and John DeLacy from uh, PEA making this presentation. So go ahead, Gar. Uh, thank you, Vicken. Um, Good evening, board of directors. I'm Garth Salisbury, MCE's CFO and treasurer. Um, as Vic and mentioned, I'm joined tonight by Justin Kudo, who's MCE strategic analysis, senior strategic analysis and rates manager. I don't know that John Delessi is going to be on. I didn't see him in the kind of in the crowd there, but um, uh, hopefully he'll get on at some point. So um, we're here tonight to talk to you about a possible adjustment to MC MCE's rates to take effect on January 1st, 2023. Okay, next slide. Earlier this year, the board enacted a limited rate increase, which also provided about $90 million in savings to our customers compared to PG&E. Um, MCE sets its race, rates based upon a cost of service model and also budgets additions to our reserves as per our board approved reserve policy. Um, if you recall during the September board meeting, a uh, board retreat and the October board meetings, staff presented on the unprecedented increases in energy and resource adequacy costs and how these increased costs are now projected to result in a net loss of $10 million in the uh, current fiscal year. Um, on November 4th, the executive committee voted unanimously to increase average system rates by four cents a kilowatt hour on January 1st, 2023 uh, to ensure revenue sufficiency and to contribute to our reserves. The proposed rate increase will be mostly offset by a projected reduction in the PCIA that our customers pay to PG&E. Um, next slide, please. So um, there's been some updates uh, since uh, the last board meeting and also even since uh, the staff report went out. Um, we have updated our fiscal outlook and projections to include um, the known economic effects of the heat wave. Um, and also to estimate the potential of a heat wave in 2023. We've, and we've experienced the heat waves here in pretty significant heat waves in two of the last three years. And so in terms of our, our budgets and projections, I think we're going to start incorporating potential heat waves kind of going forward. Um, additionally, we've received some updates, updated info just a day or two ago from PG&E. Uh, some of that info is reflected here in this PowerPoint presentation tonight. And uh, you may see some differences between the staff report and the numbers you see on the screen. Next slide. This is a look um, at our budgeted addition to net position um, and our actuals uh, for the last two fiscal years. And then the, the bars on the far right are the, are the current fiscal year. So as I mentioned, you know, MCE budgets on the basis of a cost of sets our rates and budgets on the basis of cost of service. So we look at what we anticipate it's going to cost to serve you know, our customers um, energy and resource adequacy and to run the operation. But we also then add, add in in our rates to try to capture some additional revenue for reserves and to build up our reserves over time as per our reserve policy. So we'll look back at fiscal 2021, we had originally budgeted, this is just now the addition to our net position or the addition to our reserves. We had budgeted 48 million increased costs um, resulted us in, in putting about $28 million away. Last fiscal year, which ended March 31st, 2022, we originally budgeted 41 million. And if you recall, we came back to the board for a rate adjustment to make sure that we were, we did remain positive um, in the last three months of the fiscal year, which was January, February, and March of this year. And it did result in, in a slight addition to, to savings of about 13 million. When we passed the budget this year, um, in March, um, we have projected a pretty large addition to that position of about $98 million. And um, what we experienced as we've kind of spoken ad nauseum to you is just the, you know, these increased costs have eaten completely through those that addition to reserves and now projects to put us negative uh, for the fiscal year, which ends again, March 31st, 
31, 2023. Next slide. So this is a look at um, our reserve targets, uh, which is 60% of our operating expenses each year. Um, the green or yellowish um, bars are our actual, actual reserves or net positions. So um, you know, what we've seen is as expenses have gone up, so too has our reserve requirement. Um, and we are not making a whole lot of progress on meeting that reserve requirement, again, because of increased costs and um, absorbing all those increased costs when it comes to our net position. And so as, as you know, we, we cover our costs, but then um, if, if costs end up being higher than projected, that just reduces what we put into reserve. So what we've seen is a slight increase in that reserve number from 189 to 203. Um, we project currently without a rate adjustment, but that's going to go down by about $10 million. We'll kind of dip into reserves, if you will, to pay expenses. Um, and then next year, if we make, make no adjustment for next fiscal year, we anticipate really eating into reserves to the tune of about a little over $100 million. So that's the picture and projections at this point. Um, I'm not going to turn, turn it over to Justin Kudo to talk about, to talk about rates and rate comparisons. Next slide. Thank you very much. Uh, so as this is the third time that we've talked uh, with your board about rates and revenues, I'll be brief in rehashing some of this content, but I do wanna show some updated information on how these rates compare with PG&E and other providers. I'll also be covering an updated forecast of 2023 rates for both PG&E as well as MCE. Uh, the numbers in this presentation will be a little bit different than the staff report as we received a rate update from PG&E on Tuesday night. Next slide, please. So a, a quick reminder that since March, MC has, MCE has been providing our customers a savings of about two cents per kilowatt hour. That's a savings of roughly 7% of total electric charges on customer bills. Overall, customers should be saving about $90 million in 2022 compared with PG&E service. Next slide. As Garth noted, MC uses a cost of service based approach to rates. Uh, that is something that really distinguishes MC and it essentially means that rates are set based on operational costs, primarily the cost of energy. Uh, this is different than many other CCAs, which set their rates to be equal to or just under the utility. As a result, MC currently has some of the lowest rates of any Northern California CCA. The other CCA with comparable rates here, 3CE, also uses this cost of service based approach that is more based around cost than on renewables and has a basic service uh, which, of which the rates are featured here that is only 30% renewable energy. I'll also note that many of these CCAs have standing direction to set their rates equivalent or just under PG&Es. So they're also going to be automatically raising their rates on January 1st to fill the gap that's created by the PCIA reduction that we've discussed here. Next slide. So PG&E recently submitted its preliminary November annual electric true up rate forecast with draft rates for January of 2023. We're expecting that the combination of a two cent PCI reduction, perhaps a little more than two cent PCI reduction and the PG&E rate increase for its own bundled customers would absent the proposed MC rate increase make MC about five cents less expensive and PG&E for most customers. And that comes out to about $22 a month per household. The cost savings is similar across all classes. I will focus a little bit here on residential rates and costs uh, because they're generally the most relatable, I think, to all of us. I should note that these numbers should change a little bit further before January. As we're rapidly approaching 2023, many of the variables involved in rate setting have become fixed so the numbers in this presentation should be fairly close to the final numbers. However, we believe that they may be a bit conservative. Um, that is to say that we believe that final PG&E rates may be a little higher and the PCI may be a little bit lower. If they change further before the next board meeting, we'll update them for the next presentation. Next slide. 
So currently, the average white green household electricity bill for the typical household is about $148 per month. Below, we see the impacts of various rate change scenarios. From left to right, we have each scenario, a revised 2023 electricity bill based on these scenarios, how much the typical household would see their bill increase, including PG&E rate changes, and finally, how the new total compares with PG&E 2023 expected bundled service charges. Following attention to the first row, we can see the impacts of the PCI reduction and other minor adjustments to PG&E's transmission distribution rates without any change to MCE rates, lowering bills by over $9 per month. And this figure is one that has been adjusted based on PG&E's update from Tuesday. Your executive committee and staff have recommended enacting a four cent per kilowatt hour increase to system average rates. We estimate that overall and inclusive of PG&E's rate forecast, this would raise household energy bills by about $10 per month from $148 to almost $158. This would still be a savings, however, of about $3 a month compared to PG&E service. Next slide. And this table shows side-by-side -side sample bills for each rate scenario and service level, as well as PG&E's estimated 2023 rates. A couple of notes here about deep green. Uh, earlier this year, your board voted to change the default service level for new accounts starting MC service from light green over to deep green, effective on January 1st and coinciding with its proposed rate change. You'll note that with a four cent per kilowatt hour increase, light green will still provide that savings of about $3.25 based on the current forecast, but deep green would be a small premium of about $1.34 per month. Low income customers on CARE or FARA are however exempt from paying the deep green premium, so they would effectively see the savings that are shown here for the light green rates, even if they are on deep green service. One final reminder here is that these numbers are not final. We uh, really are, think they are pretty conservative. There's some pending issues with PG&E's proposal that we believe would push their rates a little bit higher and may push the PCI back down a little. If these things were to happen, they would improve MC's rate competitiveness a little bit further beyond these numbers here. And with that, I'll be turning it back over to Garth to cover the impacts of these scenarios on MC's reserves. Thanks, Justin. So uh, this next slide um, gives you a sense uh, for the current fiscal year, what the effect um, of these different proposed potential rate increases uh, might be on, on reserves. So with no rate increase, um, we expect that, again, it will, will result in a reduction um, in our internet positioning reserves based upon you know, just um, not being able to cover all our costs. Um, with a three cent um, increase in rates, um, we would add about $40 million to reserves. Um, with a four cent rate increase, we would add about um, about $50 million to reserves and a five cent re rate increase, about 60, $63 million um, to reserves. So um, again, this is in the current fiscal year, this rate increase would go into effect if approved. Um, on January 1. And so we would be able to kind of um, cover that uh, projected loss and, and actually add to reserves uh, with a three, four, or five cent rate increase uh, for the last three months of the year. Next slide. Um, wanted to also give you a sense of sort of a cumulative look at, um, um, at what would happen next year based upon our current projections of costs. Um, um, when, if those rates, if enacted on January, were in effect for the full fiscal year next year, starting on April 1 of next year and going through 2024, March 31 of 2024. Um, again, no change would result in a very significant um, reduction in our reserves. Um, a three cent um, increase would increase those reserves to 303 million, but still well below um, our targeted, um, our target for reserves. Um, and the four cent rate increase would get us a very long ways and, and actually pretty close to our target. 
And a five cent rate increase would actually put us, we believe, beyond um, beyond our target, and we would hit that hit that mm -hmm. time um, around December or um, or January of next year. Garth, yeah. uh, uh, does does this projection for twenty three twenty four include a five to ten day heat wave sometime in the July to September time frame? Um, Director Perkins, it, it includes a heat wave. It does not include a five to 10 day heat wave like we experienced this year. Um, but there is a heat wave, um, a, a relatively moderate heat wave in there that is is not, would not normally be in our budget. So there is one, there is a heat wave, projected heat wave in there, but not like, not one like we experienced uh, this September. Thank you. Yep. Okay, um, so uh, next slide. And Next slide up to that, please. And so, um, again, staff recommends that the board approve a four cent system average rate increase effective January 1, 2023, as was unanimously approved by the executive committee. And so we would like to open it up for questions and discussion um, and hopefully uh, take a motion thereafter. Okay, questions from board members. Director Haroff, go ahead. Uh, not really a question, but uh, well, actually, there is a question in here. Um, I just wanted to reflect on um, some of the points that, uh, that that Garth made, because we did have a very robust discussion on this subject at the last executive committee meeting. Um, and a lot of it really did focus on um, what, what would happen to our reserves if we did not make uh, uh, some adjustment, some significant adjustment. And we kind of came down to the to the four cent one because it seemed like a good median uh, place to be, um, which would still make a, a have a material positive impact on on the reserves, and and the question is maybe Garth, um, because we did have a good discussion on this at the executive committee, um, and at part of that discussion was an opportunity for you to remind us of the importance of keeping um, our reserves healthy and the potential impacts that. Um, would have if we did, have to us if we did not do that in terms of our position in the financial markets. So I wonder if you could just maybe repeat some of that to this the full board tonight. Yeah, I'm just happy to do that, Director Hara. So um, I really can't stress enough um, mm -hmm. um, how important um, our cash reserves and cash position is to um, to in particular the rating agencies um, because of the, the nature of CCAs and um, you know the ability of our customers to opt out. Um, they see our, our reserve position as a single. Um, you know we have rate flexibility, but we don't have unlimited rate flexibility. We don't have captive captive customers, and so they see this this reserve position as probably the single most important aspect um, of our business model. Um, and so they that a big reserve position will allow us to weather a situation where we may have to reduce rates and and actually experience. Um, losses and not be able to cover cost of service because we, we really need to to maintain customers um, over a, a difficult period. So um, that is, it's, it's, it's extremely important um, for the rating. Um, and it's just really important that we make progress um, on our goals as well. Be again, because um, as expensive, expenses has continued to increase, um, we've not made a lot of progress um, on that on that reserve goal. And, and um, uh, this board approved um, on the consent calendar a just an extension of our existing credit facility. Um, that credit facility has very specific language that references our reserve policy and um, and the strength of that reserve policy and the necessity to continue to make progress on our reserves. So um, it's it's recognized by the marketplace, it's recognized by the rating agencies, and it's recognized by our creditors and counterparties. Thank you for that. And I just want to uh, also just reiterate uh, one thing that you did mention when we did discuss this in the executive committee, uh, the outcome was unanimous support uh, for this proposal. And um, that was after a lot of thought uh, put into the conversation, but it was unanimous and not, no one really balked when we got to it. Um, other questions or comments from uh, board members? Uh, do we have any public speakers on this item? I see no raised hands, Chair. Okay, do I have a motion? I'd like to make a motion, Tom. It's Kevin. Okay, I'll second, second, that. Girl, second by Cindy. Or Cindy. I'll give it to, I'll give it to Perry. 
Oh, man. <laughs> okay, uh, let's call a roll, please. Belvedere? I'm sorry, if, if I could interject really quickly, this is for push, moving forward the rate proposal, but there does need to be a second vote about this in the December meeting. So we would return to the board during the December meeting. I just want to make sure that's clear. Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, Go ahead and call the roll. Belvedere? Venetia? Concord? Contra Costa County, Corte Madera, Danville. Yes. El Cerrito. Aye. Fairfax. Yes. Fairfield. Yes. Lafayette. Yes. Larkspur. Yes. County of Marin. Martinez. Yes. Mill Valley? Yes. Moraga? Yes. Napa? Yes. Nevado? Oakley? Yes. Pinal? Yes. Pittsburgh? Pleasant Hill? Yes. Richmond? This part is a yes. Thank you. Richmond? Richmond? Richmond, yes. Ross? Yes. San Anselmo? Yes. San Pablo? Yes. San Rafael? San Ramon? Yes. Salcedo? Yes. Solano? Tiburon. Yes. Vallejo. Yes. Walnut Creek. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next is item eight, resolution 2022-14, amending MCE's conflict of interest code. Yeah, we will have uh, Associate General Counsel Catalina Murphy, I think, making the presentation for the discussion. Good evening, everyone. Um, this is our conflict of interest code, and it identifies the staff members and positions that need to um, file a Form 700 with the Fair Political Practices Commission. Um, each year to disclose their economic statements of interest and kind of disclose any conflicts of interest. And so every year we take a look at our code to ensure that it accurately captures um, positions held in the agency. And so in our recent review, we've identified new positions that have been added or removed. And so this represents um, the most current uh, list that we have. Um, and I do recognize that the red lines were a little bit clunky and um, I wanted to at least highlight one of them, the Director of Human Resources, um, showed up as a red line, but it um, only because it was moved in the list. It was a position that um, had been approved in a previous code, and it, that's why it was not included in the written description of changes. But happy to um, answer any other questions. Uh, any questions from board members on this item? I, I don't see any. Are there any public speakers? I see no raised hands, Chair. Okay, do we have a motion? Now's your chance, Cindy. <laughs> I'll move, I move. I'll second. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. Would you call the roll, please? <clears throat> and I just wanted to clarify, it was Darling and Pandora? Yeah. Thank you. Belvedere, Venetia, Concord, Contra Costa County, Corte Madera, Danville. Yes. El Cerrito. Yes. Fairfax. Yes. Fairfield. 
Yes. Lafayette. Yes. Larkspur. Yes. Tonya Marin. Martinez. Yes. Mill Valley. Yes. Moraga. Yes. Napa. Yes. Nevado. Oakley. Yes. Pinal. Yes. Thank you. Pittsburgh. Yes. Pleasant Hill. Yes. Richmond. Yes. Ross. Yes. Ben and Salmo. Yes. San Pablo. Yes. San Rafael. San Ramon. Yes. Salcedo. Yes. Solano. Tiburon. Yes. Vallejo. Yes. Walnut Creek. Yes. Motion carries. Uh, the next item is uh, item 10, electric, excuse me, item nine, yes. uh, power, power, power purchase agreement with Humboldt House Geothermal yes. LLC. Yeah, David Potowski is going to be making the presentation. Appreciate all the heavy work he has done and the team on bringing us the contract. So go ahead, David. Good evening, MC Board of Directors. Uh, it may feel a little bit like Groundhog Day. I've been in front of you the last few months uh, with um, power purchase agreements for our uh, portfolio. And uh, as usual, I'm happy to answer questions during uh, the, the either waiting to the end or or during uh, the presentation here. Today, I'll be talking about the Humboldt House Geothermal LLC Power Purchase Agreement. Next slide, please. So this, like many of our projects, came to us through our open season process where we go to the market and we tell the market what we're looking for. We get the, the largest volume of projects all at the same time so that we have market intel to compare these projects against each other and to choose the most appropriate projects and the best deal. Next slide, please. So we set our goals as usual, um, and there were three primary goals, which will be continue. They'll continue to be our kind of guiding light uh, as we choose these projects. Um, number one, we're looking for projects that are going to help us meet our goals as set forth in the IRP or Integrated Resource Planning document, our ten years look forward, uh, and something that we use to make our plans. We also uh, require more than ever resource adequacy or RA supply as part of our portfolio. And then um, probably the most important for the last couple of projects, and this one in particular, is the California PUC's decision uh, for midterm reliability. So we are obligated to, to comply to get projects that are compliant with this CPUC decision. So in order to meet those goals, we look at uh, PCC1 or product content category renewable energy. Um, we also look at paired and standalone energy storage. Next slide, please. So I will not um, get too far into the weeds with the four different buckets that we needed for compliance, but it's about over 360 megawatts of projects that we accelerated uh, into our portfolio because they need to come online between next year and 2026. Um, all in, this will be about eight or nine projects where typically we're working on one or two a year in the last year and a half. Uh, by the time we're done, it'll be eight or nine projects. Next slide, please. <clears throat> These are the projects that we brought to the board. Uh, in the red, July, we brought the Humidor Standalone Energy Storage Project that took care of that and one other project completely uh, took care of this generic bucket. In February, we brought the Golden Field Solar Plus Storage Project um, that completely took care of the DCPP or Diablo Canyon replacement. 
Um, and this is the second of three projects that will take care of the clean firm there outlined in green. Uh, we are feverishly trying to finish uh, our number th three up that we'll bring to the board in December. Next slide, please. So Humboldt House is a 20 megawatt geothermal energy installation. It's located just across the California Nevada border in Pershing, Pershing County, Nevada. And uh, as we looked at all of our projects, this was you know, one of the ones that, that rose to the top, a best combination of the economics, so on the quantitative side, as well as project viability on the qualitative side, which is truly important in this day and age, especially when people are up against supply agreements and permitting and transmission and so on. We really need to be careful that we're looking deep into the viability of these projects. Next slide, please. Um, 20 megawatts of energy being produced round the clock. So this is far different than a solar or wind project. It's delivering 20 megawatts, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, <clears throat> it also gives us 20 megawatts of RA capacity, which is critical. And as part of the midterm reliability compliance, it is an incremental resource, meaning that it's a brand new project being brought online. We're not, uh, in this case, we're not taking over an old contract or refurbishing a, an old plant. We're actually bringing new megawatts online. It'll come online in the middle of 2025. An explanation, this is really 20 contract years sorry, 20 years of term, but they call it 21 contract years because we're starting in the middle of one year and finishing in the middle of the final year. So it is will be 20 actual years, but they call it 21 contract years in the contract. Uh, requiring zero credit or collateral obligations from MCE. Of course, we have credit and collateral obligations from the seller to hold their feet to the fire and make sure they have skin in the game to meet their milestones and bring this very important project online. Next slide, please. So we brought a couple of geothermal projects to the board. We will continue to bring geothermal projects. And this, um, this picture here will show you why. And it really is a great illustration. The red line is our load. So that's when we're using and how much we're using in a snapshot of the year 2030. The green line is our existing portfolio of resources. Again, if we do nothing else between now and 2030, which of course we will, but just to, to kind of illustrate what adding geothermal does to our existing portfolio, the geothermal here is the flat line on the bottom. So in essence, what we're doing is we're expanding our kind of bell-shaped uh, dark green portfolio of resources, and we're moving to the important hours where we need the these resources to be producing energy. Um, one slight downside of of adding a base load or flat line is that you see there in the middle, we're above the red line, that's the, the load. And that's where we'll be using our um, standalone energy resources to capture that energy and move it to the left and to the right of our bell curve, at, which is where we need it. So the three important points there to the left, number one, we're helping fill the open positions during these important hours, our, our open positions. Eventually, we're, we're trying to have our portfolio of resources match our load. So if we can kind of by hour and by season match our load with our portfolio of generators, that's the optimal uh, position we would like to be in. And number three, we're hedging. We're using this as a hedge in the, the expensive and important hours. So hours, say, 17 to 22 when energy is very important, well, if we can move more energy in that direction, we're, we're in effect hedging those uh, volatile hours. Next slide, please. So not all contracts are the same. Um, we, we try and fight as hard as we can for, for every um, 
every term, but you know, contracts are a bit of give and, give and take. But they do include some you know, fundamentals and some unique terms, which I've listed here. So number one, we are incentivizing them heavily to perform, and we penalize them for not performing. The project will be built with a uh, project labor agreement, union project labor agreement. We have almost $2 million in security deposit to make sure that the construction milestones are met. The seller uh, will make a one-time contribution to our community benefits fund, which MCE will administer uh, once the project is built. Um, and we, we're building up quite a portfolio of cash that will um, be by MCE's choice uh, to, to pick one or more I, um, uh, benefits to the community that are either adjacent to the project location or in MCE service area. There will be guarantees for RA delivery, very, very important that um, uh, primarily we are either um, making that, getting that guarantee in, in financial form, in cash or in replacement RA. And um, very important is to also fix the price over the contract term and not have any escalators or variability so we, that we can um, know what our future cash flows will be. Next slide, please. So reiterating the project benefits, the uh, generation and the RA capacity produced by this facility are going to complement our existing portfolio as I showed in the slide, earlier slides. We will meet our MTR, or this will help us meet our MTR mandated procurement with this particular type of project and the online date. It's being developed and operated by an experienced team, very important to MCE over the long term, and it's highly viable. So we've looked at it qualitatively to make sure that the construction milestones are going to be met and are being met, and they're, you know, it's it's very normal for this to be um, still waiting to, to finalize the interconnection process with the utility. Next slide, please. So our recommendation is to authorize the execution of this PPA with Humboldt House LLC for the supply of renewable energy and resource adequacy. Happy to take questions. Next slide, please. Uh, questions from board members. Uh, Director Perkins, go ahead. Yes, is this um, contract, uh, would it be available once executed for a, what, what do we have, it? the, the pre-purchase program? Yes, it will. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Fong, go ahead. Hi, uh, great presentation. I just have two questions. One, uh, with the change in the mix in the portfolio, have you done any kind of uh, financial modeling as to what the forecast might look like over the next three to five years with more dependence on the geothermal versus our current traditional resources? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Could you ask it again, please? Yeah, bottom line is just there's a cost here. And the question is, what does that mean in the longer term as we take a look at our financial modeling and our uh, I guess, financial success. Sure. Well, I mean, you can look at it as you're fixing your costs now as a hedge. So you're fixing your costs now. They're very, um, the, the hours that we're using this to fill in um, are very valuable and very expensive hours. They're also very volatile during the volatile times. So for example, the hours 17 to 22. So after five o'clock, between five and nine, five and 10, um, during a heat event, or you know, those are typically very expensive hours anyway. Uh, but if there is a, a heat event, the, those um, hours can be extremely volatile. And so in essence, now we're fixing those at a fixed cost, which is um, you know, market-based. Yeah, and, and I appreciate the, the qualitative value. I guess I'm looking at it from the, the consumer's perspective, which is, you know, as we change our mix in this portfolio, we're, we're becoming a little more uh, reliant on geothermal. What does that mean to their rates? 
Bicken, would you like to take that question? Yeah, uh, thank you, David. Uh, Director Fung, so first of all, we do look at the, um, the procurement team looks at the short term and long term about what does it mean, what the prices mean uh, in the market. Uh, you mentioned five years, that's relatively short term. We look at up to 20 years or so if we can, based on location and ISO market conditions in addition to congestion. The other thing is uh, uh, Lindsay Saxby's group in uh, Garth, um, they work together to, and they will be working more together about identifying, as you're bringing it up, rate pressures. What does this mean to the consumer, right? Because we're getting a lot of uh, mandated type of procurement to do from the PUC. Uh, like they, David had mentioned, you know, filling behind uh, Diablo Canyon, although Diablo Canyon gonna continue to run. Uh, mandates about how much geothermal to have in our portfolio. And that is in addition to solar and wind that we are going after. Uh, one uh, future item that we will be bringing to you is uh, from the governor's office, we have 35,000 megawatts of ocean-based wind generation. Right, uh, these are going to be very expensive things, and we are looking at what does it mean to our budget, even if we don't add any additional customers to our, uh, like cities and counties to our portfolio. So, long story short, yes, uh, we will be bringing more information to you on those things to the board, and we do look at it in the short term and long term also. I hope okay. you answered your question. Can I add yeah, one? you you go. I'm sorry. Uh, up, just please. adding one more nuance is that um, the cost of resource adequacy in the last year has quadrupled or more. And so if we're fixing this cost at today's price, it is it really acts as a terrific hedge. As, you know, if we're looking to uh, at our ratepayers and protecting them to kind of buy at today's prices with you know, knowing that prices have gone up, but quadrupled or more for resource adequacy, this is really a prudent move to to lock in the, the prices now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, again, um, I like to learn to appreciate this a little more from a quantitative perspective. Uh, and I think secondly, uh, some form of communication strategy that, uh, that sets expectations as well as gives us, and I think the consumer some better appreciation of what you're trying to achieve in the path on getting there, I think would be helpful instead of, uh, you know, uh, they get surprised with either a rate increase or some adjustment because there's a, a compliance cost or some additional cost, and they wonder what's going on and, you know, what's what's led to that point. So yeah. Yeah. anyway, I'll, 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 defer to, I'll defer to others to, uh, to ask questions, but uh, I, I'd like to see a little bit more quantitative analysis and uh, discussion on this subject later. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments from uh, board members? Uh, do we have any members of the public wish to speak? I see no raised hands, Chair. Okay, is there a motion? I'll move it. I would like to move that we go ahead with the power purchase agreement with Humboldt House Geothermal LLC. I'll second that, Quinto. Okay, motion by Kohler, second by Quinto. Uh, call the roll, please. Belvedere. Venetia. Concord. Pasta <clears throat> County. Corte Madera. Danville. Yes. Alfredo. Yes. Fairfax. Yes. Fairfield. Yes. Lafayette. Yes. Larkspur. Yes. County of Marin. Martinez. Yes. Mill Valley. Yes. Thank you. Moraga. Yes. Napa. Yes. Nevado. Oakley. Oakley. Yes. Thank you. Pinal. Yes. 
Thank you. Pittsburgh. Yes. Pleasant Hill. Yes. Richmond. Yes. Ross. Yes. San Anselmo. Yes. San Pablo. Yes. San Rafael. San Ramon. Yes. Salcedo. Yes. Solano. Hebron. Yes. Vallejo. Yes. Walnut Creek. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next uh, item and our last item is item 11, board matters and uh, staff matters. And I'll, I'll start off, I, I, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, transitions. Um, this is the time of year that uh, uh, some of us are either leaving or looking at leaving, including myself. Uh, I'm termed out my last um, uh, city count, my, last city council meeting will be in December and and uh, my last uh, my my transition will be on January 10th so I have one more meeting of uh, MCE left and um, I think there are others here who are this may be their last meeting either voluntarily or involuntarily and for, for those of you who are leaving for one reason or another um, I just want to tell you how great it's been to work with you. This is an incredibly uh, collegial, dedicated, hardworking board, and um, everybody's contributed. Uh, it's just been an absolute pleasure for me. Uh, you know, this is, I think, my 10th year in working with this board, and uh, it's probably one of the best things I've, I've done as mayor. If there are any others of you who, uh, you know, who's... The, who, who's, if there are any others of you of which this meeting will be your last and you want to say a few words, I would invite you to. Uh, go ahead, Ford. I, I'm in, in that group too. Uh, my status is a little different. I, I did not get reelected. Uh, I'll be out uh, as of December 15. I think at this point, uh, I'm the longest standing member of MCE having um, started to represent San Anselmo on it in either 2009 or, or 2010, uh, and was originally the swing vote that brought uh, San Anselmo on board. And uh, I've enjoyed greatly uh, working on this board, working with all of you. Unfortunately, due to COVID, uh, there hasn't been uh, the kind of opportunity to uh, get to know you uh, after the meetings or during breaks or before that otherwise uh, would be available. And I, I regret that. Uh, it's a great organization, as, as you know. Uh, and I just wish everybody uh, the best good fortune uh, in guiding uh, this vanguard and exemplary organization in the future. I'll have one more executive committee meeting and a technical committee meeting, but this will be my last board meeting. So uh, have a happy Thanksgiving and a Merry Christmas to those of you that I won't see in the future. Thank, thank you, Ford, for your long years of service. Uh, I'll miss you. Of course, I'll miss all of you, but uh, <laughs> who wants to go? Who, who wants to go next? Direct, Director Meisner, go ahead. Uh, you're muted. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so I just want to, whoops, before I go, I will say it is, I, my last name is actually Meissner. <laughs> um, so just, uh, if you're looking me up, it's Meissner. I uh, term out. And so I, I do believe um, I'll be at the next meeting if we have the uh, board meeting in December. Um, but I just want to say, uh, I also, so I've never really met anybody, you know, except for <laughs> I met Lindsay and Stephanie from the staff. Um, at the event in, in Vallejo at the Forest Service, um, but I've never met any of you guys. Well, I, I, I must say, Mayor Bud, I've met you mm -hmm. at some other events outside of this group, um, and I really enjoyed talking to you and um, some of your sage advice that you've given me over the past years. Um, so maybe I'm going to crash a meeting uh, next year when you guys are live, <laughs> just so I'm going to introduce myself. Um, but I really enjoy uh, enjoy this group so much that the um, 
what we're doing, you know, the mission of MCE and uh, just being able to meet people across the Bay Area. It's really very cool. So I appreciate all of your knowledge to incredibly bright group and I hope it's rubbing off on me. So mm -hmm. you all, it's uh, been a pleasure and I will see you in December and I'm going to crash a meeting in next in 2023 just so I can shake people's hands. So thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, Director Kohler, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not speaking for myself. I'm speaking for Denise Athos. Um, I don't believe Denise, uh, Denise chose not to run. And unfortunately, she and her husband just got COVID and flu shots and mm. texted me that they were down for the count. That's why she's not here tonight. And I believe she told me she'll be changed out on December 6th. So, and I think along with Ford, she's one of the longest serving members. And actually, when they're gone, I might be the longest serving member. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I've been on here a long time, but I think it's uh, the changing of the guard. And um, I'm sure Denise would love to speak to all of you. And she's just been wonderful for all the years she's been on MCE. And, I've learned a lot from her, from you, Tom, and from Ford, and um, only got to see Katie on Zoom. But um, I think it will be really sad to see so many folks leaving. So I'm hopefully um, she'll crash a meeting as well. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for speaking for uh, for Denise. I'm sorry she can't be here with us tonight. Um, Anybody else? This is in any board matter anybody wants to talk about, not just people leaving, but uh, uh, Director Murphy, go ahead. Hi, good evening. Um, you know, I felt like I wanted to join in. Um, I, the difference is I wanted to actually just say thank you um, to Mayor Butt, to Director Butt, and also to Director Green. Um, this is now my second year on the MCE Clean Energy Board, and I just wanted to say thank you both. Um, for really opening your arms and, and sharing your institutional knowledge, your sage advice, uh, your wisdom, but also your friendliness and your friendship. Um, I, I, I wanna reiterate, uh, Director Green, how you were so open to meeting with me um, on the technical committee. And again, you are so, so experienced and just very helpful. And I'm just um, very grateful for that. And, uh, and Mayor, but you, uh, have a wonderful sense of humor and you're great to sit at a duck 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 dinner with um, and I just again want to thank you both for your leadership and, and for your service but also for again um, your willingness to really pass the baton to folks who are uh, new to our councils new to MCE and and um, you know working for the betterment of our community still and the public good so just wanted to thank you both and um, that's it. Thank you uh, Director Perkins go ahead. Well, De Devin took darn near everything I was going to say. I, I want to thank you, Tom, uh, for your leadership in so many ways, you know, in Contra Costa County and, and MCE. And, you know, I, I'm the lucky guy that gets to take your seat in LAFCO. So I may call you up and get some LAFCO uh, guidance, too. So um, and, and Director Green, you, you really have been. Uh, there us, for us on the technical committee and, and providing a lot of insight into how the history of this thing has worked and how we got to where we are, because uh, this is by far one of the best run organizations I've uh, been associated with. And, and it comes from staff, it comes from the board, um, it comes from the, uh, the senior leadership all around. So, so Ford and Tom, thank you for your thoughtful guidance over the years. Uh, thank you. Uh, Director Quinto, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I, I echo what my colleague uh, Scott Perkins just said, and, and I am the other LAFCO rep that will uh, be taking your place and uh, uh, huge shoes to fill. Uh, what I wanted to say to, uh, you know, I agree with uh, uh, my colleague regarding Denise Sathis, and it has been a, a pleasure to work with her and to uh, Ford and to Tom. Uh, Denise said, uh, uh, was uh, very welcoming when, when I joined the League of Cities uh, uh, board, uh, state board. So uh, she will be missed. And she's a fellow El Cerritan and uh, attended uh, El Cerrito High. And uh, so she'll always be an El Cerritan to me, uh, even though she uh, 
moved many years ago to Marin County. So grateful to her, uh, grateful to the leadership of Ford, uh, you know, and uh, to you, Tom. And despite what our colleagues say in, so in the Sierra Club Bay chapter, I'm here to say as a former board member of the Sierra Club, we support you and grateful to your leadership here and regionally in Contra Costa County and statewide. I enjoyed working with you uh, on uh, the Environmental Policy Committee and uh, you always took the role of uh, leadership uh, and representing all of Contra Costa, uh, despite what my colleagues in El Cerrito and Berkeley say, uh, we are grateful to you. So thank you. Uh, Director Haroff, you're next. Uh, thanks, thanks, Tom. Um, I feel like I'd be piling on <laughs> uh, and I don't wanna do that. Um, uh, I do share the sentiments that everybody have just expressed in everybody and, and and you, Tom, in particular for your, your leadership uh, of this group. Uh, but I actually wanted to call out in particular Ford. Um, uh, Ford and I have both been on, um, I think at the, at the outside of my tenure on, on, this, on this board, on the technical committee, that was the first assignment that I took on. And I've appreciated very much, although we don't always see eye to eye, um, I think uh, the, the efforts that he has put in that making uh, those committees work um, is greatly appreciated. And I just wanted to express that uh, personal sadness that we won't have you uh, involved in those committees again in the future. Um, th thank you, Kevin. But the, the one good thing about leaving now is I, I get to leave when we see the PCIA work at least once in our favor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, we keep getting more people here lined up. Uh, Director Thier, go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to echo the comments of my colleagues um, and thank Ms. Meissner and Denise Athens, who's not here, and also um, to you, Ford Green, uh, and to you, Mayor Bud. Um, I, I really want to give you a big thanks. You know, I started off uh, as when I was new to MCE and just listening to your reasoning and your discussion. And, um, you know, I, I really do want to thank you. And I think people who don't, who are not elected and who are not in public service, don't realize that every task you take on serving on the MCE board, you know, you're really sharing a piece of yourself and you're giving your time, your energy, your mind, your ideas, your thoughts, and we're going to miss all of that. So thank you for your service. And um, we hope to still see you and uh, uh, at the meetings as well. Uh, Director Scales Preston, go ahead. Yes, thank you, um, Director Butt. Um, it's really been a pleasure to work with you and serve on the MCE board with you. Um, it's almost like the long goodbye, because I know for the mayor's conference, we'll be uh, doing the same thing here in a couple of weeks. And so, um, but you have been a great mentor, and I just always appreciate your boldness um, and willing to speak your mind um, and just being that trailblazer here in Contra Costa County. I've been able to work with you here, but also in my role as working for the congressman and the things that we have been able to do um, as me being a staffer in his office. So I really just appreciate that and look forward to giving you well wishes in a couple of weeks here. Okay, and uh, Jamie Tucky, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add a note that I believe there are six board members who are going to be departing this year. And on behalf of staff, we're so incredibly grateful for all of you and your dedication and service. Um, and I wanted to just mention that at our December 15th board meeting, even if this is your last board meeting, I hope that you can join because we are planning on having um, an item to recognize and honor our departing board members. So please join us at the December 15th board meeting as well for additional um, comments and thanks and celebrations. We, we almost have enough to start an alumni club. <laughs> hey, uh, Tom, Mayor, uh, Director Butt is vacant. I just want to uh, thank you for your basically no-nonsense approach on things. Really appreciate that. You cut the, uh, you know, to the chase and get things done. And I want to mention to Director Green that I really uh, gonna miss 
the deep dives we have done on contractual matters and how things work and what have you. So I hope we can find a way to continue that. Uh, the other thing on behalf of Don, I just want to thank you sincerely for those very kind words for MCE. We wouldn't be what we are without Don. So that's, that's no bull. I'm just being very honest about it. So thank you again for everything you have done. Appreciate it. Uh, Director Wagon Connect. Well, thank you. Uh, one of the things I've appreciated about MCE over these years has been um, the governance and the working through and, and the example of, uh, of us, you know, doing a, a bit of a rate, a rate increase um, to keep our, our um, reserves high enough so that we're, we're safe. That's good governance, and that's what we've done um, you know, all the way through. And it, it's been good leadership for the entire CCA world. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other items that come under board matters and staff matters? Anybody else? Um, I guess do we have any public speakers on this item. I see no raised hands, Chair. Okay. Well, that brings us to adjournment. Is there? Anybody who objects to adjourning this meeting? <laughs> okay, hearing no objection, uh, we will adjourn to December the 15th. And uh, uh, whether, you're, whether you're off or termed out or whatever, uh, you know, you're all invited to that, uh, to that meeting. So yes. we'll see you then. Good night, thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Have a good night, everybody. Good night.